All right. Chapter 7. There was a rose bush on the little sterling lawn, growing beside the gate. It was called Doss's Rose Bush. Cousin Georgiana had given it to Valency five years ago, and Valency had planted it joyfully. She loved roses, but of course, the rose bush had never bloomed. That was her luck. Valency did everything she could think of and took the advice of everybody in the clan, but still the rose bush would not bloom. It would throve and grew luxuriantly with great leafy branches untouched of rust or spider, but not even a bud had ever appeared on it. Valency, looking at it two days after her birthday, was filled with a sudden, overwhelming hatred for it. The thing wouldn't bloom? Very well, then. She would cut it down. She marched to the tool room in the barn for her garden knife, and she went at the rosebush viciously. A few minutes later, horrified Mrs. Frederick came out to the veranda and beheld her daughter slashing insanely among the rosebush boughs. Half of them were already strewn on their walk. The bush looked sadly dismantled. Doss, what on earth are you doing? Have you gone crazy? No, said Valency. She meant to say it defiantly, but her habit was too strong for her. She said it deprecatingly. I, I just made up my mind to cut this bush down. It's no good. It never blooms. It will never bloom. That's no reason for destroying it, said Mrs. Frederick sternly. It was a beautiful bush and quite ornamental. You've made a sorry-looking thing of it. Rose trees should bloom, said Valency a little obstinately. Don't argue with me, Doss. Clear up that mess and leave the bush alone. I don't know what Georgiana will say when she sees how you've hacked it to pieces. Really, I'm surprised at you, and to do it without consulting me. The bush is mine, muttered Valency. What's that? What did you say, Doss? I only said the bush was mine, repeated Valency humbly. Mrs. Frederick turned without a word and marched back into the house. The mischief was done now. Valency knew she had offended her mother deeply and would not be spoken to or noticed in any way for two or three days. Cousin Stickles would see to Valency's bringing up, but Mrs. Frederick would preserve the stony silence of outraged majesty. Valency sighed and put away her garden knife, hanging it precisely on its precise nail in the tool shop. She cleared away the severed branches and slept, swept up the leaves. Her lips twitched as she looked at the straggling bush. It had an odd resemblance to its shaken, scrawny donor, little cousin Georgiana herself. I certainly have made an awful-looking thing of it, thought Valency, but she did not feel repentant, only sorry she had offended her mother. Things would be so uncomfortable until she was forgiven. Mrs. Frederick was one of those women who can make their anger felt all over a house. Walls and doors are no protection from it. You better go uptown and get the mail, said Cousin Stickles when Valency went in. I can't go. I feel all sort of peaky and piney this spring. I want you to stop at the drugstore and get me a bottle of Red Fern's blood bitters. There's nothing like Red Fern's bitters for building a body up. Cousin James says the purple pills are the best, but I know better. My poor dear husband took Red Fern's bitters right up till the day he died. Don't let him charge you more than 90 cents. I can get it for that at the port. What have you been saying to your poor mother? Do you ever stop to think, Doss, that your kin only have one mother? One is enough for me, thought Valency undutifully as she went uptown. She got Cousin Stickle's bottle of bitters, and then she went to the post office and asked for her mail at the general delivery. Her mother did not have a box. They got too little mail to bother with it. Valency did not any expect any mail, except the Christian Times, which was the only paper they took. They hardly got any letters but Valency rather liked to stand in the office and watch Mr. Carew, the gray-bearded, Santa claus old clerk, handing out letters to the lucky people who did get them. He did it with such a detached, impersonal, Jove-like air, as if it did not matter in the least to him what supernal, hor uh, what, what supernal joys or shattering horrors might be in those letters for the people to whom they were addressed. Letters had a fascination for Valency, perhaps because she so seldom got any. In her blue castle, exciting epistles, bound with silk and sealed with crimson, were always being brought to her by pages in livery of gold and blue. 
but in real life, her only letters were occasional perfunctory notes from relatives or an advertising circular. Consequently, she was immensely surprised when Mr. Carew, looking even more Jovian than usual, poked the letter out to her. Yes, it was addressed to her plainly in a fierce black hand, Miss Valency Sterling, Elm Street, Deerwood. And the postmark was from Montreal. Valency picked it up with a little quickening of her breath. Montreal, it must be from Dr. Trent. He had remembered her after all. Valency met Uncle Benjamin coming in as she was going out and was glad the letter was safely in her bag. Now what, said Uncle Benjamin, is a difference between a donkey and a postage stamp? Well, I don't know what, answered Valency dutifully. One you lick with a stick and the other you stick with a lick. <laughs> Uncle Benjamin passed in, tremendously pleased with himself. Cousin Stickles pounced on the times and Valency got home, but it did not occur, occur to her to ask if there were any letters. Mrs. Frederick would have asked it, but Mrs. Frederick's lips at present were sealed. Valency was glad of this. If her mother had asked if there were any letters, Valency would have had to admit there was. Then she would have had to let her mother and Cousin Stickles read the letter and all would be discovered. Her heart acted strangely on the way upstairs, and she sat down by her window for a few minutes before opening her letter. She felt very guilty and deceitful. She had never before kept a secret letter from her mother. Every letter she had ever written or received had been read by Mrs. Frederick. That had never mattered. Valency had never had anything to hide. But this did matter. She could not have anyone see this letter. But her fingers trembled with a consciousness of wickedness and unfilial conduct as she opened it. Trembled a little, too, perhaps with apprehension. She felt quite sure there was nothing seriously wrong with her heart, but one never did know. Dr. Trent's letter was like himself, blunt, abrupt, concise, wasting no words. Dr. Trent had never beat her about the bush. Dear Miss Sterling, and then a page of black positive writing. Valency seemed to read it at a glance. She dropped it on her lap. Her face ghost white. Dr. Trent told her that she had a very dangerous and fatal form of heart disease. Angina per... Can I read this? Angina pectoris. Evidently complicated with an aneurysm, whatever that was. And in the last stages. He said without mincing manners that nothing could be done for her. If she took great care of herself, she might live a year, but she also might die at any moment. Dr. Trent never troubled himself about euphemisms. She must be careful to avoid all excitement and all severe muscular efforts. She must eat and drink moderately. She must never run. She must go upstairs and uphill with great care. Any sudden jolt or shock might be fatal. She was to get the prescription he enclosed filled and carry it with her always, taking a dose whenever her attacks came on. And, of course, he was hers truly, H.B. Trent. Valency sat for a long while by her window. Outside was a world drowned in the light of a spring afternoon. Skies entrancingly blue, winds perfumed and free, lovely soft blue hazes at the end of every street. Over at the railway station, a group of young girls was waiting for a train. She heard their gay laughter as they chattered and joked. The train roared in and roared out again. But none of these things had any reality. Nothing had any reality, except the fact that she had only another year to live. When she was tired of sitting at the window, she went over and lay down on her bed, staring at the cracked, discolored ceiling. The curious numbness that follows on a staggering blow possessed her. She did not feel anything except a boundless surprise and incredulity, behind which was the conviction that Dr. Trent knew his business and that she, Valency Sternling, who had never lived, was about to die. When the gong rang for supper, Valency got up and went downstairs mechanically, from force of habit. She wondered that she had been let alone so long, but of course her mother would not pay any attention to her just now. Valency was thankful for this. She thought the quarrel over the rose 
She thought the quarrel over the rosebush had been really, as Mrs. Frederick herself might have said, providential. She could not eat anything. But both Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles thought that this was because she was deservedly unhappy over her mother's attitude, and her lack of appetite was not commented on. Valancy forced herself to swallow a cup of tea, and then sat and watched the others eat, with an odd feeling that years had passed since she had sat with them at the dinner table. She found herself smiling inwardly to think what a commotion she could make if she chose. Let her merely tell them what was in Dr. Trent's letter, and there would be as much fuss made as if, Valancy thought bitterly, as if they had really cared two straws about her. Dr. Trent's housekeeper got word from him today, said Cousin Stickles, so suddenly that Valancy jumped guiltily. Was there anything in thought waves? Mrs. Judd was talking to her uptown. They think his son will recover, but Dr. Trent wrote that if he did, he was going to take him abroad as soon as he was able to travel, and wouldn't be back here for a year at least. That will not matter to us much, said Mrs. Frederick majestically. He is not our doctor. I would not. Here she looked, or seemed to look accusingly right through Valancy. Have him to doctor a sick cat. May I go upstairs and lie down? said Valancy faintly. I I have a headache. What's given you a headache? asked Cousin Stickles, since Mrs. Frederick would not. The question had to be asked. Valancy could not be allowed to have headaches without interference. You ain't in the habit of headaches. I hope you're not taking the mumps. Here, try a spoonful of scoot vinegar. Piffle, said Valancy rudely, getting up from the table. She did not care just then if she were rude. She had had to be so polite all her life. If it had been possible for Cousin Stickles to turn pale, she would have. As it was not, she turned yellower. Are you sure you ain't feverish, Doss? You sound like it. You should go and get right into bed, said Cousin Stickles, thoroughly alarmed. And I'll come and rub your forehead and the back of your neck with red ferns lemon it. Valancy had reached the door, but she turned. I won't be rubbed with red ferns liniment, she said. Cousin Stickles stared and gasped. What, what do you mean? I said I wouldn't be rubbed with Redford's liniment, repeat, repeated Valancy. Horrid, sticky stuff, and is the vilest smell of any liniment I've ever saw. It's no good. I want to be left alone, that's all. Valancy went out, leaving Cousin Stickles aghast. She's feverish, she must be feverish, ejaculated Cousin Stickles. Mrs. Frederick went on eating her supper. It did not matter whether Valancy was or was not feverish. Valancy had been guilty of impertinence to her. And that's the end of chapter 7. This has taken a turn I did not expect. I was told this was a romance novel. I didn't expect leading lady dies at the end. <clears throat> Uh, I don't, I don't know what to do with that information. <laughs> Unless the doctor is just very wrong. It's not like he could have done a very thorough examination. Maybe it's one of those things where, like, she's told she's going to die, so she makes radical changes to her life, and it turns out she's not going to die. I, I don't know, but I, I don't know what I was expecting. It's a, it's a very strange turn. I, I suppose I was expecting. I actually don't know what I was expecting. I had no I like. Yeah, no, I had no real clue what to expect here. I'm perfectly shocked. 